certainly pleased to gather together uh, as the followers of Christ in whatever way we can do it. <clears throat> and this is a way that we can do it, and we just praise the Lord for this opportunity. I want to share just a couple of announcements with you. Uh, the next few Sundays, uh, next Sunday we will be uh, having the grace notes from our church uh, ministering in song uh, for the service, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, so that will be next Sunday. The following Sunday is Father's Day, and we will have a, a special service uh, honoring fathers, and there will be a surprise that day. So invite uh, family, friends to come for that, and we look forward to that time of fellowship and worshiping Christ, and we want to honor fathers on that day. And then on the 28th, we will again meet, and we'll be looking at the power of gathering. Uh, I think it's interesting to look in Scripture where we're told where two or three are gathered in my name, you have the power of God at work. And we see lots of gatherings taking place in our country in different ways. And I think it's good for us as Christians to take a look at what God does through his people when they gather to pray, gather to hear the word of God, and desire to uh, show forth uh, the things of Christ in the building of the church. So that'll be the uh, 28th. And then Wednesday nights, uh, we are still doing the live streaming online at 7 o'clock. We are also opening up, if you are uh, comfortable coming, meeting inside with the distancing uh, guidelines that are in place, you can also do that on Wednesday nights, uh, beginning this Wednesday. And I believe that's all the announcements. I do thank you for your continued uh, support, uh, working together in these unusual times. And also, uh, sometimes I feel like I need to apologize for all the emails. But I appreciate you being aware of the emails. That's our best way of communicating to everyone uh, today under the circumstances. So keep an eye out for the emails as they continue uh, to come. So at this time, we'll have the prelude as we begin to prepare our hearts together to worship Christ.
Let's ask God's blessing on our time together. Father in heaven, we do rejoice for the opportunity that we have today to gather together. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for the grace of God that is evident because of the work of God in our lives, the work of salvation, the work of sanctification, uh, the work of the uh, Holy Spirit in our lives. And we thank you for uh, the plan that you have ordained for the church. We thank you for the uh, small part that we can play. And as we depend upon your power, your grace to use us in whatever way you have for the ultimate purpose of building your church, completing it, and glorifying your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we are thankful for uh, the church and we pray your continued blessings upon it. And once again, Lord, we pray for one another, and as we reflect on each other, as we desire to show love to one another, we pray for the various needs that each one has here today. We rejoice that you are uh, very aware of each and every need. We also are very thankful that you have promised to meet our needs according to your riches and glory, and that as we cast our cares and burdens upon you, that you hear those prayers, that you hear those cares and burdens, and that you meet those needs in such a way that we give praise and glory to you. And so, Lord, we pray today for one another. And, Lord, we pray that as we uh, consider our country today, uh, the various needs that are very clear as people are uh, crying after different things, different needs, And yet, Lord, we know that the ultimate answer is always found in Jesus Christ to meet needs. And Lord, I pray that you would watch over our country. We pray that we would continue to have the freedom to meet. We pray, Lord, that we would not take that freedom for granted, but we would recognize that it is an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, we pray your blessings on this service. We pray that our hearts and minds would be focused upon Christ. May we sing to him. May we open our hearts to the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And by the grace of God, may we leave here today encouraged in our faith. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. world you step down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adorable all of the lives that cling to so here I am to worship
His presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. scripture reading this morning, I'm going to be reading uh, from Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39, and today we're going to look at uh, the woman at the well from John chapter 4 and the message this week and next, and see how Christ meets all of our needs, and how that truth not only gives us the assurance of everlasting life, but also reminds us that all of our needs day by day are met in Christ. And Romans chapter 8 plays into that theme quite well. So I'm reading from Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, in the light of everything that is taking place around us, that one verse, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, Christ is the answer for all of our needs, and I trust that that is a truth that is fixed deeply in your hearts and minds, no matter what the circumstances around us, no matter what the circumstances you're going through each and every day. So may God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. And we want to continue to give you the opportunity to worship Christ together as we continue with song. Oh. 
you take your Bibles this morning and turn to John chapter 4, this week and next we'll be looking at the uh, encounter of Jesus Christ with the woman at the well, and I trust that it will be a blessing to you as we look at how Jesus Christ met the needs of this woman and how he meets the needs of all who follow him. All of our needs are met in Christ Jesus. And that is a wonderful blessing that many times I think we forget, we take for granted. But as you think about the statement, Christ is all I need, do you believe that? Christ is all that I need. And not only do you believe that, do you live accordingly? Uh, To believe something should have the impact upon our lives in such a way that no matter what comes, In life, no matter what trials, tribulations, blessings come, that as we are looking to Christ, believing that he is all that we need, we also take that truth when we face the difficulties of life, and it takes us through whatever comes into life. And so as we look at this passage this week and next, I trust that it will encourage the believer Uh, to be reminded that Christ is all that you need for anything in life. Also, if you are without Christ as your Savior and you are looking for answers, looking for help, uh, we would readily point you to Jesus Christ who meets all of our needs. Our spiritual needs, our everlasting needs, all of our needs are found met in Christ Jesus. So today we want to look at the beginning of this passage, and the first thing that we see is that he is the answer to all of our needs. Verse 1 through 4, uh, we see the account where Jesus is the answer for everyone. Uh, he's the answer for anyone, for everyone, for who, whomever will live. Christ is the answer, and it begins to unfold in verses 1 to 4. And it says, therefore, when Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. We see here that there are some facts that the writer of the Gospel of John brings out here in chapter 4. And the first thing he states is that Jesus, as he was ministering, he began to realize and he knew that his popularity with the people was growing. Uh, There were many people following him. There were many people coming to him for answers. And as a result, the Pharisees were becoming jealous. They were becoming upset uh, with Jesus that they were losing the common people. Uh, They were no longer coming to them, but they were running to Jesus. And Jesus knew that the timing was not right for that ultimate encounter with the Pharisees where they would move to see that he was crucified. And so John records at this point, uh, Jesus realized that he needed to leave the area and go to a different place. And so he's leaving Judea. He's going to depart to go to Galilee. And it says that he needed to go through Samaria. Now, it's interesting here that if you look at a map and you look at Judea and you look at Galilee and you look for the shortest route, you're going to notice, well, you go through Samaria. That just makes common sense. If you've ever looked up on MapQuest a destination and they give you different routes you can choose from, which one do you normally choose? Well, you choose the shortest route. That's what we want to see happen. We get there as quickly as possible. So if you looked at the map and you looked at where Jesus was going, you would say, well, he's going to go uh, through Samaria. That's just common sense. It's the quickest way. However, in that day, that would have been very unusual for a Jew to travel through Samaria they would have avoided Samaria because of the differences between the Jews and the Samaritans. There was no love loss there. Therefore, when a Jew would travel from Judea to Galilee, they would go around Samaria. 
they would not go through. And you look at the history of why it was that way. Well, the Jews looked down upon the Samaritans because they had uh, married Gentiles. They also had brought in different aspects of religion into the Jewish faith. Therefore, the Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. They may have even looked upon them and had more hatred for them than they did for a Gentile. And so as we see here, John is recording that Jesus chooses a different route than what was normal. And those disciples as Jews would not have chosen this route either. They would have went around Samaria. So John makes a note of that. And you you say, well, why did Jesus do that? Well, verse 4 tells us why. It says, but he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through there. Was it because he was wanting the shortest route? No. The answer is because Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he came and he knew at this time that he was to go to Samaria and do what? Well, as we see the account unfold, we will see that he shares the truth with this Samaritan woman who then takes the truth about Jesus to her town, to her family. And so he needed to go because he came to seek those who were lost. And so John is recording. Now, Jesus went the route that we never would have went, but he needed to go there because he came to save the lost. And that tells us that Jesus is the answer for everyone. It does not matter what the race is, doesn't matter the gender, doesn't matter the age. Jesus Christ is the answer for everyone. And that certainly needs to be at the heart of any church, at the heart of believers, that we share Christ with everyone. And many times that can be challenging uh, when we see different lifestyles, different types of people. But remember, whom does Jesus save? He saves sinners. And all of us are in that boat of being sinners, but by the grace of God, Christ saves sinners. And so he's the answer for everyone. And verses 5 and 6, it shows that he is the answer because of who he is. So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now that looks like it's just details and facts that are just informative, but there's truth there that, again, shows us why Jesus Christ is the answer to anyone's needs. It shows us here that as he came to this well, he sat down, and it says it was the sixth hour, and he was weary from his journey. Now, if you know the Gospel of John, you realize that in John's Gospel, he is emphasizing the deity of Jesus Christ. From the first verse to the last verse, the Holy Spirit of God led the the writer of the Gospel of John to emphasize that Jesus Christ is God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that's speaking of Jesus. And here, John brings in a different point, and he says, here's Jesus Christ He has been walking, traveling this journey. It's the sixth hour. It's noon. It's getting warm. And so it's a hot day, and he sits by the well. Now, why would John bring that out? Well, he's also emphasizing here the humanity of Jesus. So in the light of the whole of the Gospel of John, we see that Jesus Christ is God. At this moment, we see that he is fully man as well. And so when we take Jesus Christ as fully God and fully man, and we look at the Gospel of John in its whole, what does it tell us? Well, he was the perfect sacrifice for our sin. He was the only sacrifice, fully God and fully man, that would be acceptable to God the Father for our sins. And so the Gospel of John is bringing that truth out. The woman at the well is going to begin to see by the grace of God who Jesus is as he presents himself to her. 
And at the heart of this is that he is the answer to our sin. He is the answer to all of our needs because he is God and he was fully man and his sacrifice was acceptable for our sin. So the answer to all of our needs is Jesus. And he's the answer for each one of us. And he is the answer because it was God's plan to send his son to be that perfect sacrifice for our sin. The encounter Jesus has with the woman begins to unfold. And in this encounter, Jesus Christ is going to offer to her to meet all of her needs based upon who he is. And the first thing we see is that it's an unexpected encounter. Verse 7 said, A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now we see here that this is an unexpected encounter for this woman. As she comes to draw the water uh, for the day, she sees Jesus sitting by the well. She knows that he's a Jew. And so her assumption is, well, I'll go get my water. We won't talk because we just don't do that. Jews don't talk to Samaritans. I won't talk to him. He won't talk to me. I'll do my work and get out. And so as she approaches the well, she is shocked when Jesus says to her, would you give me a drink? Uh, that was shocking on two fronts, not only because he was a Jew and she was a Samaritan, but also because she was a woman. And even Jews and rabbis of that day would not even speak to their own wife in public uh, because of the different rules and regulations that they had drawn up. So this was a shocking encounter for her, as she probably expected to just get in, get her water, and then get out of the way. And so Jesus says to her, how can you speak to me seeing these differences? And when you think of the, the point that's being made here, think about Jesus Christ seeking to save that which is lost. Jesus Christ, not only here in this, this uh, account, but in our lives and in the lives of so many others who have known the gospel of Christ, the work of God in our lives, you think back to your own testimony. Were you expecting what came when Jesus Christ came into your life? It's an encounter I don't think we plan for. I don't think we have an idea of where it's headed. But certainly we find in Scripture that it is God who is doing the work of saving his sheep, saving his own. And he is building his church. And here's just a wonderful example of Jesus Christ. He needed to go. And he needed to go to speak to this woman, to present the truth of himself to her, and to draw her to himself. And so this is an unexpected encounter that begins to unfold here. And Jesus now begins to put before this woman, here's what I have to offer to you. Uh, he is witnessing to this woman about what he can offer to her and how he can meet all of her needs. And there are five different things in verses 10 through 26 that he offers to her. And let me encourage you that as we work through these five things to make them personal, the same thing that he did for this woman is the same thing that he has done for you if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And the first thing in verse 10, this unparalleled spiritual help begins with a gift. Jesus said, said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have, would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Here we see that Jesus says to her, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for water. You would be asking me for living water. And who is he? Well, it tells us right here, if you knew the gift of God, you would be asking me to give me living water. 
Now, what's the gift of God? Well, it's pretty obvious to us as the followers of Christ that Jesus is talking about the reality that God the Father sent Jesus Christ the Son to be what? Uh, A gift to the lost. Jesus Christ came and he gave himself to whomsoever will believe can receive that gift where living water, spiritual life, all of our needs are met in Christ. And so he begins the conversation to get her thoughts directed toward who was sitting right there by that well. I'm the gift of God, he says. I'm offering spiritual life, living water. And if you knew who I was, you would receive it. And so we see the first thing is that Jesus offers himself as a gift. Verse 11, he offers spiritual sight. The woman said to him, Sir... You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Now, this is fascinating to see this conversation unfold. Jesus is speaking spiritually. She is still thinking what? Well, literally, not thinking spiritually. And so she is saying naturally, you want to give me water? And you're sitting here, and you have nothing to draw the water with. How can that be? So what are you thinking? Well, what Jesus is thinking is spiritually. And he's thinking spiritually in the sense that he gives us living water or he gives us everything that we need to meet our spiritual needs. In Christ, everything we need to deal with our sin is met. Every hope that we have within our heart's desires are met in Jesus Christ. And she doesn't see that at this point because she's spiritually blind. And just like every single one of us before Christ, spiritual things were what? We didn't understand them. We didn't know Christ. We didn't know God as they truly are. We didn't know the things of God because we were spiritually blind. But with Christ, what happens? Well, our eyes are open to the truth of the gospel. Our eyes are open to the truth of Jesus Christ and to God. And so at this point, she's still unable to see who Jesus is. And so he continues to make the offer of himself, including Jesus offers everlasting life. Verse 12, she says to him, Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? In other words, she's continuing to think, literally. You know, Jacob provided this well that we've been coming to for years. What are you giving to us? You know, where's your well that we can use? And Jesus said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And so the woman is thinking, well, I'm coming to this well. Jacob made this well years ago. We've used it for so many years. What do you have to offer? And Jesus says, the the water that I give you, you taste of it and you will never thirst again. Think of that again in your own Christian life. When God saved you, When you received Christ as your Savior, when you saw with your your eyes as the Holy Spirit of God enabled you to see it, what you have in Christ, what did Jesus give you? He gave you spiritual life, spiritual well-being, so that you never have to thirst again. You might say, well, what does the thirsting mean here? Well, the idea that Jesus is putting forth is this. It's a spiritual thirst where we long to have our heart's desires met. Every person that has been created by God naturally has desires, and they're not wrong. You know, we have the natural desire to be happy. We have the natural desire to have security. We have the natural desire to have peace. And people are, are looking for it. You look at the situation around the, the, our country today, what are people longing for whether they realize it or not? They have desires that they're looking to have met, 
but they're looking in all the wrong places. And Jesus offers what? You come to me, I'll take care of your sin, I'll give you everlasting life, and I'll meet every desire of your heart. No longer will we have to seek after peace and happiness and joy and purpose because we found it in Christ. And this is what he's speaking of. I'm offering you this spiritual water. I'm offering myself, and I will quench your spiritual thirst. And he then addresses, as she continues to not see at this point, uh, what he's speaking about. He offers the answer to her sin. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Now, I love that response. Uh, it shows clearly she still doesn't know who Jesus is, and she's thinking the way any one of us would think. Uh, here she had to come every day to get water for herself, for her home, and she had to bring it back. And now here's this guy sitting here who says, you drink the water I give you, you won't have to make so many trips back here because you won't be thirsty. Well, she's thinking, well, yeah, let's see it. I'll take it because it would make her life easier. But he's talking about a whole different type of, of thirst. And so he says to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now what is Jesus doing? As God, he knew everything about this woman. He knew her history. He knew her present situation. He knew her sin. And she, he is pointing it out to her because you cannot receive that water without recognizing that I have a need. Every single one of us who have known the saving grace of God first had the Holy Spirit of God point out what? You're a sinner against God. Whatever the sin, it's still the same before God. We are all sinners against God, and it is Jesus who offers the answer to the sin. And so what he is doing for this woman, he's pointing out, you need the water that I'm offering. You need me to take care of your sin. And that's the wonderful truth about the gospel. For those of us who have known saving grace, we have known what? All of our sins have been cared for by Jesus Christ and his work on our behalf. All of our sins have been washed away. All of our sins have been taken away from our record and replaced with the righteousness of Christ. And in that alone, there is so much to rejoice in as we drink that in and realize, thank you, Jesus, that you have taken care of all of my sins. And this woman needed to realize this at this point. But it's interesting how she responds to Jesus Christ saying, you know, I know about your situation. I know about your standing before God, and you need me. And she says, well, I suspect you are a prophet because how could you have known this any other way? And then she says in verse 20, and it leads to Jesus offering the ability to worship. But notice what she says. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Question, what did that have to do with her sin? Absolutely nothing. What do you think she's trying to do? She's trying to change the topic. And again, we see this as a common thing for People. It's common for many of us before salvation. We did not want to recognize our sin against God. We wanted to change the conversation. We wanted to push it away. And so I think that's what she's doing here. When she brings up this situation that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans, for years they've been arguing, where is the best place to worship? Of course, the Jews would say Jerusalem. 
Those Samaritans would say it's a, another place, a, the, the, the mountain that was in their location. And so they argued back and forth for years. So she, to change the subject, says, well, what do you think? And it's interesting that Jesus doesn't dismiss the question fully, but he brings her back to see her need of having that living water. And so verse 21, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming will you will na- neither of the mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. What's Jesus saying? Well, he's pointing out to her that it is the Jewish people who are God's people. And he, being a Jew, is pointing out, saying, we We have been God's people to receive the written word of God. We have been God's people through whom the Messiah would come. So he's beginning to draw her attention to that fact. The Samaritans are not God's chosen people. Salvation is coming through whom? It's coming through the Jews. And verse 23, But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Where is he taking her heart? Right to the inner man. He's taking her thoughts back to what exists between her and God within her heart. And he says true worship happens how? It happens in spirit, and it happens in truth. God is looking for those who are not so concerned about outward actions, religious ceremonies, but he's looking for those who from their heart worship God. Now, who can do that? Well, the ones who can do that are those who have tasted of the living water. It's those who have known Jesus Christ who can worship from the heart, and they do so in the truth, which is based upon Our worship is based upon the whole counsel of the Word of God. Based upon the truth of Scripture, we then turn in our hearts to worship God. And so he's taking her down that path because he's pointing out what? In your present condition, it doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem or on the mountain. You can't worship God. You need a heart change that comes only through Jesus Christ. And so the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. What is she indicating? Well, the Samaritans only use the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. And in that writings of Moses, Moses prophesied about the Messiah coming. And he wrote and he declared, There is one who is coming who will declare and teach all things to you. So she knew that teaching found in Scripture uh, from the Pentateuch, that God had said there would be one who was coming who would teach them all things. And then Jesus said to her in verse 26, I who speak to you am he. What is Jesus now revealing to this woman? He is saying to her, I am. I am God. He is saying to her, I am the Messiah. I am the promised one. I am the one who can teach you all things. So Jesus Christ is presenting himself to her as she looks at him as a Jew, a Jewish man who should not be speaking to her, as she looks to him as someone who may be talking, you know, in a funny way about water that takes away your thirst. And then Jesus says what? You need to see me for who I am. I am God in the flesh. I am the promised Messiah. I am the one who can meet all of your needs. Next week, we will see how God, Jesus Christ, continues to open her eyes to that truth. But as we conclude this morning, think about these five things that we're reminded of concerning Jesus Christ in relationship to your own life, as you consider, is Christ all that you need? Now, looking around today, knowing uh, each one of you, I would say probably every one of you, if I said, raise your hand, if you think Christ is all you need, you'd all raise your hand. However, 
are we continuing to look to Jesus Christ to meet all of our needs? That's where it gets hard for us sometimes. Many times we turn away from the living water and we look to people to meet our needs. Or we look to government to meet our needs. Or we look to circumstances of, of power and money and things of this nature, hoping that it will meet our needs and satisfy our hearts. And we forget what? Jesus Christ is all we need. He's all that we need to live day by day with hearts that are satisfied in Christ, with hearts that have no fear, with whatever comes our way, because Jesus Christ is all that we need. And I want to encourage believers here this morning to take that to heart, to remember that every single day, no matter what's going on out there, no matter what's going on in your personal life, always look to Jesus. He's the one who has met your needs. He's the one who's meeting your needs. And he's the one who will meet all of your needs throughout glory. Praise God for that. But we can't forget it. Jesus Christ meets all of our needs. You now, as I was thinking this through, to help you apply it, um, all of us many times can look elsewhere for our needs to be met. You now, we look to people to meet our needs. You know, a person might look to their spouse. Well, I need my spouse to meet my needs. Well, I would tell you this. Guess what? They can't. God might use them to point you to Christ. Uh, God might use them to be used of God to help meet your needs. But if you're looking to a spouse to meet your needs, uh, you're going to be disappointed. And oh, by the way, you're expecting something from them. They can't deliver. But Jesus Christ can and I, please understand, that doesn't mean that you can't be used of God to minister to people. But ultimately, our needs are met in Christ. If you're looking to government to meet needs, well, that's a big mistake. Uh, God has ordained government, has a plan and a purpose for it. But it's not where the Christian finds our heart's desires met. It's not in government. If you're looking to things to meet our needs... You know, so many people look to things. If I just had more money, if I just had this or had that, I'd be happy. Guess what? Even if they get it, they're still not satisfied. Only Jesus Christ can meet those needs. And you look at this woman at the well. She was looking for things in life, and she was dissatisfied. That's why God used her. Five different people. She had gone through relationships looking for what? happiness and joy and purpose in life, she wouldn't find it until she finds Christ. And then all of her needs are met. So as believers, never lose sight of the fact that if you've received Christ as your, as your Savior, you've had a drink of that everlasting living water, then you have Christ and all of your needs are met. And then if there's anyone today who's here without Christ, God's Word says that you're a sinner against God. God reveals that you're looking for answers in all types of things in this world, in other people. But guess what? It will never satisfy your spiritual longing. But if you come to Christ, He offers that water. That if you receive Him as the answer to your sin, surrender your life to Him as, as your Lord, then guess what? You drink of that water and you'll never thirst again. You'll have joy, happiness, peace, eternal hope of being with him in glory, and a reason for living each and every day here on this earth. And we thank God for Christ, and I trust that this encourages you as the followers of Christ, that Christ is all I need. Praise God for that. Praise God that he has saved us, brought us into that position, and may we move forward remembering it and giving Jesus Christ all the glory for what he has done for us. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the living water. We thank you for the one who knows how to meet all of our needs, who cares for our sins, who walks beside us every step of the way, 
and who is even now preparing a place for us in heaven where he will continue to meet our needs throughout glory. Lord, we thank you for Christ. Thank you for all that he has done for us. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the faith, that you would give us the reminders from the word of God that each and every day we want to live looking to Jesus Christ for our needs to be met. Help us not to turn away. Help us not to look elsewhere, but draw us closer to him. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. Let's close our time together and stand as we sing. Thank you for coming. We had beautiful weather today, and we just thank the Lord for that. And let's close our time together in prayer and again giving Christ all the praise and all the glory. Thank you, Father in heaven, for Jesus Christ. Thank you for his work on our behalf. Thank you for all that we have in him. And Lord, I pray that we would live, leave here today encouraged in our faith, uh, encouraged to cast all of our cares upon you. Encouraged to continually, continually look to Jesus Christ who meets all of our needs. And we just thank you in his name. Amen.